If you have your Bibles, 1 Samuel chapter 16 is where we're going to be. We are kicking off a short series in the life of David. Uh, If you've been with us uh, the past six weeks, we've been going through our By Faith series, talking about what it means to live by faith and all that the implications of that are in our own lives and uh, transitioning now into the life of David. And so being able to take a look at a few of the instances in David's life and uh, hopefully can learn something not only about David, but about God and how he longs to work in our lives. But uh, before we then dive into this, would you, church, just pray with me? Uh, Father, we come to you this morning and just echo our pastor's heart, Lord, of longing for redemption, Lord, longing for you to work and to move to redeem this world, Lord, and actively. And so, Father, we pray that we as your church would be active, Lord, that we would not be passive or consumers or just passengers, Lord, sitting, and that we would be active, Lord, as your Spirit leads us and guides us into uh, difficult situations, Father, um, bringing reconciliation through the blood of your Son. So, Father, we ask that you give us opportunities to move toward the most vulnerable, to fight for justice, Lord, to pray for your spirit and the renewal of all things. And so, Father, we ask that you bring revival, uh, Lord, first to our own hearts, Lord, that we would be overwhelmed by you, Lord, that our homes would be filled with your presence, that this church, your bride, would manifest your presence in the world, Lord, and that that revival would spread beyond these walls into our community and state that we love so much. So, Father, we ask, as your people, that you would move. Father, would you speak to us this morning, right where we're at? Lord, help us to listen and obey. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Uh, If you were with us, church, in the By Faith series, um, you could walk away with that, just expecting God to do amazing things. And I think there's so much to the expectation of a big God doing big stuff that only he can do. And there's something so encouraging about that, of saying, God, you're so much bigger than I can even imagine. I'm going to start praying for bigger things and asking you to do what only you can do. And we can come with this expectation, what I think is, is really healthy, but there's an equal uh, important thing for us to learn, and that is to recognize God in the small and the ordinary. Because if you're like me, you can come out of that by faith series and think, okay, cool, God does big, huge, amazing things. He's a big, huge, amazing God. But I I just go to work and come home and pay my bills and eat my dinner and then go to bed. And there's no crazy move to this country, do this, that. I just go to work and I come home and take care of my family and I just day after day after day. And so we can, we can oftentimes just think, well, maybe God's not working in my life. And so our encouragement as we move into the life of David is we see God working in the ordinary. God working in the ordinary. This is something that we learn about in the life of David. Even though David's life is anything but ordinary, the story of David tells us that God works in the ordinary. One commentator pointed out there are no overt miracles In the story of David, there's no splitting of a sea or food raining from heaven or signs and wonders. It's a shepherd called to be a king who's on the run for 20 years, who's a mediocre husband, a bad father, all while he's walking with God. The miracle in the story of David is God's faithfulness in the everyday ordinariness of life. Eugene Peterson calls it the earthiness of our lives. It's the single longest narrative that we have in Scripture, and there's a lot for us to learn from a life of David. But uh, our default reading of Scripture, if anything like me, anytime we get into narrative or a story, we have a tendency to inject ourselves into it, right? This is what our imaginations do as we read these stories. Um, we, we picture, you know, Noah building this ark, and we think, oh, man, I wonder what that would be like. I can picture myself doing that, you know, using our imagination. We inject ourselves in the story. Or, or Moses standing before the sea with a rod, and, and you put your rod, and then all of a sudden the sea splits. And man, how crazy that would be. Or we're Abraham being called out of our homeland to go to a, a place we don't know about. 
right? We inject ourselves and we think, oh man, yes, that's, yeah, I can see that. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be so amazing. We can inject ourselves into these biblical stories. Uh, as we look at the life of David, though, I really want to challenge you guys with something. As, over the next few weeks as we do this, I want us to do our best to not inject ourselves into the story. Because the story is not um, Donnie pretending to be David or Micah pretending to be David. It's David. It's David's story. I don't fight Goliath. <laughs> I, I go to work and I go home. There's some giants I'm worried about, right? I, I, I'm not David. David's David. He fights Goliath. He waits and waits and waits and waits and waits to become king. He commits adultery and fails. He's on the run from his own son. That's David's story. What I want us to do with these stories, though, as, as good a stories as they are, and as, as a natural uh, inclination is to inject ourselves into these narratives, is to realize that the same God who appointed David king, the same God who anointed David, the same God who was faithful to David in all of the running and hiding from Saul and all of the highs and lows of life, the same God who did all that wants to interject himself into our story, into our lives. Not only in big ways, but in mundane, everyday ways. In the highs and lows of marriage. In the, pa- in the parenting and grandparenting. In the dirty dishes and the bills and the layoffs. God is working in the lives of believers. In the mundane and the ordinary The life of David teaches us to acknowledge God in the ordinary. Eugene Peterson uh, puts it this way. David deals with God as an instance of humanity in himself. He isn't much. (laughs) He has a little wisdom to pass on to us on how to live successfully. He was an unfortunate parent and an unfaithful husband. From a purely historical standpoint, he was a barbaric chieftain with a talent for poetry But David's importance is not in his morality or his military prowess, but in his experience of and witness to God. Every event in his life was a confrontation with God. What we learn from David is the witness of God in the the highs and lows, in the big and in the ordinary. God is there working. So this morning... We look at this over the course of David's life, as we begin this series, David is, is such a complex person. It's the full display of humanity we get in his story, right? We get, we get the shepherd boy becoming the victorious king, the lover and the poet, the warrior, the worshiper, the victor, and the failure. It's all on display for us. And so this morning, we look at a few of these events that are going to point to David's trust in and patience with God. Trust and patience. The root of this was not David's own ability, right? Amazing man as he was, a military commander, rallier of men. His trust and patience was not in his own ability, right? Or his favorable circumstances. Okay, cool, I'm David, I'm born into the right family at the right time, and now I'm king because of it. That's not the case. Or his, his quick deliverance from bad situations, right? Oh, that's why he trusted, because every time something happened, he got out of it right away. Wrong. <laughs> Reading his story, it is the exact opposite of all of those things. And so we could look at this from an outside perspective and say, there's no way this person should be trusting in and have patience with God. It seems like a bad joke. All of this, though, points us to the things that we can learn about who God is and what God is doing in our ordinary lives. So if you're taking notes, there's three things that we're going to look at this morning that we learn about God from the story of David. The first thing, if you're taking notes. First thing, God is faithful when we aren't. God is faithful when we aren't. If you have your Bibles, 1 Samuel 16, verse 1. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? Since I have rejected him from being king over Israel, fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. And invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what to do. And you shall anoint for me him whom I declare to you. So Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. 
And the elders of the city came to meet him with trembling and said, do you come peaceably? Verse five, and he said, yes, peaceably. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. A little bit of backstory here before we dive into this. Um, Up until this point, the nation of Israel has been led and, and ruled by God. He is their king. He has led them, brought them out of the wilderness, deliverance from Egypt through this this 40 years of wilderness wandering and established them as a people, fighting their battles, giving them victory, protecting them. They have a king and ruler and his name is God. But over time, um, like us, they can become envious of the people around them. Um, I don't know if, if if you're like me, the neighbor comes home with a brand new car. And you're like, oh man, check that thing out, dude. Yes, that thing is awesome. Meanwhile, I'm praying my tires hold air. And I'm like, please, Jesus. We can become envious of the people around us. The nation of Israel is no different. They go to Samuel, their prophet, one day. Samuel, 1 Samuel 8, verse 5. They say, hey, Samuel, do us a favor. Verse 5, appoint for us a king to judge us like all the other nations. Samuel, we're tired of being the weird kid who says their king is invisible. Like, we want to be like the world around us. They go on later in verse 20, and it just flat out say that we may be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. Well, wait, hold on a second. Wait a minute. God's already doing that for them. He's already going out before them and fighting our battles. He's already judging them and caring for them. He's already doing the work of a king for them. But yeah, well, he's invisible, though. I can't see him and touch him. I want, I, I'm exhausted about living by faith. I want to live by sight, and I want to be like the nations around me. Uh, we really, um, as much as we can vilify the nation here, church, as we turn that same uh, lens inward, how often we can do this? Well, I just, you know, I'm, I see the wicked, uh, to use biblical language, I see the wicked prospering. We can think of the wicked as these people who are just in horrible states all the time, and they're never happy, and it's, and I'm looking at their lives, and I'm like, well, yeah, they kind of are happy, like they have a bunch of stuff, and, um, but what happens, but I come to, these the psalmist language, then I come to the house of the Lord, and I realize their end. We can become envious of the nations around us, the people around us, and all that they have, and all their happiness, and all the things they have to fill the empty void of their lives. We can become envious. And in the everyday, ordinary moments, we can forget about God and say, well, man, if I just had that, you know, and Amazon Prime, God bless Amazon Prime, two-day shipping, like, it's here on my doorstep, and I have it, and now, nope, didn't fulfill like I thought it was going to. In the everyday moments, we can become, for moments, unfaithful to God and forgetting Him and longing for something else. And so, um, God responds. He tells Samuel, okay, Samuel, these guys want a king? Give them a king. But tell them, tell them how it's going to be, that it's not going to be fun, that they're gonna, the king is going to take all their best. And so, so uh, God says to Samuel in 1 Samuel 9, 16, tomorrow about this time I will send to you a man from the land of Benjamin, and you shall anoint him prince or leader over my people Israel. He shall save my people from the hand of the Philistines. Listen listen to, to God, what he says here. For I have seen the affliction of my people because their cry has come to me. If this was us, we'd be like, oh, you don't want me to rule over you? Cool, good luck. <laughs> go, go find yourself a king. Let him take care of all your problems, all your complaints, send it off to him. But God doesn't do that. He says, okay, I'll appoint a king for you because I still want to deliver you. I still want to care for you. I'm still going to be faithful to you, even though you've rejected me. I'm still going to be faithful. We see God's faithfulness to his people, even in their midst of the lack of faith. And he provides not only faithfulness, but he provides people to remind them of his faithfulness. Samuel was one of those people, constantly rehearsing in the ears of of God's people, hey, remember how God delivered you? Remember how God's fought for you? Even though you want a king, he's still faithful to you? So much so that even as, as Samuel is winding down his ministry, right, he's concluding, he, he says there um, in chapter 12, this is what he tells the people of Israel, right, as they have 
come to the realization, man, maybe we shouldn't have asked for a king. Maybe that was a wrong move. This is what Samuel says to them. Do not be afraid. You have done all this evil, like subtle jab. <laughs> Remember all this evil you guys did? Yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all of your heart. Do not turn aside after empty things that cannot profit or deliver because they are empty. For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake because it has pleased the Lord to make you a people for himself. What a, what a contrast to how we would operate. Even in rejection, even in faithlessness, God still says, oh man, it just pleases me to have you as my people. It pleases God. Peter echoes this in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. Peter says this, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you would not receive mercy, but now you have received mercy. Church, that we, in all of our flaws, in all of our failures, in all of our faithlessness, would be called God's people. We were called out of darkness. Why? To proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into light. This is why we're here, to proclaim the goodness of God in calling us out, church, and being different. And by the power of the Spirit of God, we can do that. We can start to recognize how good God is in forming for himself a people and the pleasure that he, that he derives from that. How often we need to remind each other of this, of God's faithfulness when we are faithless. 2 Timothy 2.13, Paul sums it up this way. If we are faithless, he remains faithful for he cannot deny himself. All the moments, church, we, when we forget God, when we become distracted by empty things, God is still faithful. And God has lovingly put people in our lives to remind us of his faithfulness, to call us back into being faithful to him. Samuel is one of those. The life of David for us is one of those. And so the, the story moves on, right? They select, you know, Saul selected as king, and things are good militarily. They're doing their thing. They're conquering. Military-wise, Saul's tremendous. As a leader and worshiper of God, not so much. Worshiping God is secondary for Saul. It's not the primary goal. Now, for God's people, that's a problem. Because that's, their whole identity is caught up in obeying and following God. And so what happens? That God says, look, at some point God just says, okay, we're, we're done here. We're done. Tell Saul I've rejected him as king. And so Samuel does this. And so Samuel, no doubt, is, is feeling the weight of this as the prophet in Israel who has anointed Saul as king. His reputation is now kind of, okay, what happened, Samuel. And he's feeling that weight. And so we, we pick up here in, in chapter 16, verse 1. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul, since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? He's no doubt feeling, man, these, this, this king failed. The people, if they failed, they rejected God. Man, God, why are you, why are you uh, what's going on? What's going on here, Lord? So God says, how long are you going to grieve? How long, Samuel? I got, I'm doing something here. I'm still faithful. He says, fill your horn with oil and go, for I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. It reminds me of the same language that's used as Abraham is there on the, on the mountain, ready to offer his son as a sacrifice. And the angel of the Lord stops him and says, no, God himself will provide a sacrifice. Pointing to who? Christ. This here, David's life is a picture of what Christ would do, coming to be a king for us. So how long? So this, this plan is hatched to go to Bethlehem to anoint a new king. And so they, they have this plan. Samuel's going to go and they're going to worship and they're going to barbecue together and they're going to celebrate God. And God is going to reveal to the prophet Samuel who the next king is to be. So, so Samuel does this. So God is faithful when we are faithless. Second thing, if you're taking notes, God sees when we don't. God sees when we don't. Pick it up in verse 6. When they came... 
All right, the sons, Jesse and his sons come to the barbecue. They're ready to, to worship and get down on some good food. When they came, he looked on Eliam, the oldest, and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his outer appearance or the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel and said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made Shammah pass by and he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, are all of your sons here? And he said, there remains yet the youngest, but behold, he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and get him for we will not sit down until he comes. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. And Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Shammah. God sees when we don't. So the the brothers, they, they come. And the first brother stands up, and and Samuel's like, yes, this is the guy. This is the guy. This is what a king looks like. This, yep, surely this is the Lord's anointed. This is the one. It's got to be. This is a a familiar tactic in the nation of Israel. 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 2. And he, Kish, Saul's father, had a son whose name was Saul, a handsome young man. There was not a man among the people of Israel more handsome than he. From his shoulders up, he was taller than any of the people. So this is is how it's gone. Okay, this guy looks like a king. We want this man, Saul, to represent us. When people think of Israel, this is the man in the face that we want them to see. Handsome guy, super tall, looks like a king. This is our representation. This guy is going to be our leader. And so Samuel, like any of us, would say, okay, yeah, we, want, we don't want, you know, we want to be represented well. <laughs> this son of Jesse, this is the guy. This is definitely him. But God says, no, I've rejected him. Why? Because I don't see like you guys see. Man looks at the outward appearance. But I, God, look at the heart. All seven brothers pass by. All seven of them. And God says, no, I've rejected all. Listen. Not the one. At this point, if I'm Samuel, I'm like, God, why do you keep doing this to me? (laughs) You call me to go here. (laughs) This guy brings his kids out. These seven dudes pass by, and you say, no, they're not here. Well, why'd you call me to come here? (laughs) I'm getting kind of embarrassed at this point, you know? Like, God, come on, help me out. And so he just asks, like, are all all of your sons here? (laughs) Please let there be another one somewhere. Yeah, oh, yeah, we we have another one, but that's baby brother. He's a nobody. I mean, the word he uses, youngest, this, it literally means in least. Yeah, there's, there's another one, but he's the youngest. He's out with sheep. What? No. Um. He's not even significant enough to bring to the party. This is the context that David is living in. Okay, yeah, okay, we're going to go worship God at this party. We got invited by the prophet. David, you go keep the sheep while we're gone. Go, go do your job. We'll, we'll be back later. Not even significant enough. He, church, he's not even named yet. He doesn't even say, oh yeah, David, yeah, or something. No, the, the least. He's out there, yeah, I'll go, I'll go get him. Even his role, keeping sheep is insignificant. It's a, low, it's a low job, right? Shepherds don't become king. It's insignificant. But how often, church, in God's upside-down kingdom do we see shepherds playing an important role? Jesus himself, I am the good shepherd who will leave the 99 and go after the one that's lost. That's what kings do. That's what our king did. So what a contrast, though, to the current king. The current king. You you, you put Saul in a crowd, he's the one that everyone's attention is drawn to. He's taller than everybody. He's the most handsome guy in Israel. So everyone's like, oh, yeah, that guy, I'm going to go hang out, yes. Meanwhile, David's not even at the party. He's keeping sheep. (laughs) This nobody baby brother had nobody's attention but God's. 
God says, I see. I, I am not looking at outward appearance of the height. I'm looking at his heart. Church, I wonder how many of us would like David to be able to identify with being ordinary. And we would say, oh, you know, if, if you were to ask me, I am non-important. <laughs> in the grand scheme of society, in life, I, I'm not important. I'm just a mediocre, ordinary guy. A mediocre, ordinary mom. Whatever the case may be. I don't have influence. I don't have amazing social media following. People aren't asking me for my autographs. I don't stick out in a crowd. I'm nobody. But who does God see? God sees the nobody, church. The one that's lost is the one Jesus goes after. Our good shepherd knows and he sees. And so even as we go through life, as we think of the world around us, and man, all my problems, I'm insignificant. No one knows. No one sees what I'm going through. God does. The story of David teaches us that God sees when we don't. God sees. But not only does he see, he finds value in the ordinary. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26, Paul writing says this, to us as the church. Consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you were in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. God finds pleasure in forming a people for himself that are ordinary, that the world would just gloss over. The world wouldn't say, oh, look at these guys, head and shoulders above everybody else. No, we're, we're just part of, the, part of the crowd. And God says, these are the people. I want, I want to call these my people. And I want to use them to confound the wisdom of the world. I want to use them as redemptive influences in a community that I love. But God, I don't have the influence like other people do. I don't care. I want to use you right where you're at. This is what the story of David teaches us, God working in the ordinary. So does this mean that all of us, you know, are going to be called to to lead a nation? Okay, one day God's going to say, okay, I want you to be president. No, probably not. But what roles are we called to? And where are we supposed to live this out? Thirdly, if you're taking notes, God works while we wait. God works while we wait. What happens? David, there is anointed before his brothers. Awkward situation. (laughs) Baby brother's going to be king? Samuel leaves and goes back home. And then what happens? Saul's still king. Verse 14 of chapter 16 of 1 Samuel. Now the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him. Saul's servant said to him, Behold, a harmful spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord now command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who is skillful in playing the lyre. And when the harmful spirit of God is upon you, he will play it and you will be well. So Saul said to his servants, provide for me a man who can play well. One of the young men answered, behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing, a man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a man of good presence, and the Lord is with him. Therefore Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, see, send now David your son who is with the sheep. And Jesse took a donkey loaded with bread and a skin of wine and a young goat and sent them by David, his son, to Saul. And David came to Saul and entered his service. And Saul loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. And Saul said to Jesse, saying, Let David remain in my service, for he has found favor in my sight. And whenever the harmful spirit from God was upon him, David took the lyre and played it with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the harmful spirit departed from him. If we were writing this story, this is not how it's supposed to go. I'm king. I've been recognized by God as anointed and anointed as king. But now I have to wait. Not only do I have to wait, I have to go and serve under the current king who God has rejected. We can look at this as wasted time. 
Well, I'm just hanging out until this dude dies, and then I get to be what God promised me I could be. We can view it as wasted time. We can think of, well, there's, there's going to be this moment in history when I break on the scene and everyone realizes, this, this is my role, this is my purpose that God has made for my life, and here it is. All of my life has been preparation for this moment. All of the years of wilderness wandering. We see these wilderness time in the Bible where it's, it's, it's God dealing with people in obscurity of trial, of testing, of working, of speaking and listening and moving of preparation, of life with God. And we can think of our lives as the same thing. Okay, well, this is just the ordinary, is the waste of life, but one day, then, one day, then I'll... That's not how God does it at church. God doesn't have wasted time. He doesn't say, well, yeah, one day you're gonna do this great thing, and in the meantime, just hang out. That's not how it works. Every moment with God is important. Every moment with God is an opportunity to hear him and to learn about who he is and what he's called us to. Think of the language that David uses in the psalm. So oftentimes it's, it's, it's the king, God bless the king and God do this and that and it's kingly language. But there's also these moments in the psalms that I love so much that is pastoral shepherding care language of things that he encountered about God from just being with sheep. Think about, if you were to ask anybody outside the church, what is, what's, can, you, can you quote a psalm? They'd say, oh yeah, Psalm 23, right? The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. David's role as shepherd was an opportunity to learn about who God was. And what does David say? The Lord is my shepherd. <laughs> this is how I know care. This is how I know love, by being a shepherd. And this is how God has revealed himself to me as a loving, caring God. He is like I am to these sheep. And so church, um, normally I, I like having like something, like an object or some sort of thing to help illustrate. It helps me learn. You guys watch me process through things on, up here. I don't have that today because you are the object's lesson today. So as we think about this, is God working while we're waiting, waiting in quotes, waiting? What's your role? Not your identity. I know what your identity is. Your identity as a believer is a son and daughter of God. That is your identity in Christ. Your job doesn't define you. Your parental role doesn't define you. That is part of your identity. But your ultimate identity is, as a believer, a son or daughter of God. But what is your role? What has God put in your hands right now? You say, well, I'm, I'm just an electrician, man. I go to work and I provide power for people and then I go home. Okay, cool. Or I'm an engineer, I design things, and I, I, I make things come to life, and that's, that's what I am. Or I'm a stay-home mom, I just care all day long for kids who always have a need. <laughs> God wants to use that role to reveal himself to you about something about his character and who he is. For David, it was shepherding. Man, God has revealed himself to me as my shepherd. <laughs> How many shepherds do we have in the room? Anybody? For us, the context is lost. I don't know what shepherds do. I don't, know what, how, I don't know what that looks like as to be a shepherd. I'm thinking you make sure sheep don't die. Like that's the ultimate win, a successful day. I don't know what that looks like. But I know what it looks like to come alongside people as a pastor and help them identify God moving in their lives. Helping, helping them through emotional times of turmoil and stress to say, okay, let's see what God has to do here. My wife would, would say, okay, I'm a stay-home homeschool mom. She would know, she would know what, a, what a shepherd does, but she would know what it looks like to teach and train up kids and to care for so many needs constantly. So if, if she would ask her, you'd say, oh man, God is my stay-home mom who is constantly caring for me at all times. Do you understand the point I'm getting at? God wants to teach you through the role that is in your hands something about himself. This is your arena to live out the word of God in your lives. So what's your shepherd work? The, the world would view, oh, wasted time. You're not important. God says, no, this is the important work. This is the role I've called you to. This is how I'm going to teach you about who I am and what I want to do. What is your shepherd work, church? At the end of the day, it's all God work. In these everyday moments, 
We learn about God and trust and patience. We learn to trust God when the bills come and the money's gone. We learn patience when the diagnosis doesn't come back favorably. Okay, God, what are you going to do? We want to rush the process, but God isn't in a hurry because this is important work, and David's life points to that. As we wind this thing down, how long does it take? God, how, we ask that question, God, how long? I'm anointed king. I'm serving Saul. When is this going to move on? 1 Samuel 18, 12 tells us that Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him, but had departed from Saul. So jealousy is driving Saul into a frenzy of saying, I'm, I got to get rid of this guy. God's with him and not with me. I'm jealous. I want to be king. I'm just going to kill this guy. And so for years, David is on the run as anointed king. Okay, God called me to be king, but now I'm being hunted. God, where are you? For years and years and years. Fast forward to 1 Samuel 24, David's in a cave, hiding, hiding from someone who's hunting him. And Saul comes in. And David's men say, David, this is, this is the moment. We've, we've talked about this, how God has anointed you to be king. This is the moment God has prepared. Now is the time. This is how it ends, man. This is how you become king. Just, God's giving him in your head. Just take care of it. Just kill him. What is David's response? 1 Samuel 24, verse 6. The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to put out my hand against him, seeing he is the Lord's anointed. David's view of Saul blows my mind. The language that he uses, the Lord's anointed. <laughs> David was anointed. David was anointed as the next king of Israel. But he realizes that just as he was anointed, Saul was anointed. He is trusting God to fulfill his promise. God, you're working. I can easily short circuit this whole thing and shortcuts and let's do this and I want to be. But he's like, no, this is the person God has anointed. The same God who chose David had chosen Saul. It was a God who directed his attention to a nobody shepherd boy. It was God who was speaking and working and teaching him what it meant to care for sheep and people. It was God, and it would be God who would exalt him. So he waits. Another time, he has another opportunity to do it, to take matters into his own hands, and he refuses. And so Saul dies. David, at this point, is age 30. He becomes king of the southern tribe of Judah. It's not even a complete fulfillment of what God has promised. He's like, okay, you can have the southern tribe of Judah. Church, it took somewhere between 15 and 20 years. That's a long time to wait. And what does 2 Samuel tell us? 2 Samuel 5, verse 10, as the worship team can come on up, it says, David became greater and greater for the Lord God of hosts was with him. It was all God. It wasn't David's military might, David's strategy, David's winsome personality to draw men to himself. It was God who was with him in that waiting. It was God who would exalt him and carry him on. Verse 12 of 2 Samuel 5, and David knew that the Lord had established him king over Israel and that he exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people Israel. See, David was a gift to the nation of, and a, an example of God's faithfulness to his people. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, as we close, Paul says this, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Church, the work that started by the sacrifice of Christ, it was God-initiated, it was not us deserving God's favor. It was not, okay, God, we've been really good and we need redemption, so let's do this. No, it was, we were enemies of God, rejecting him. We don't want you to rule over us. But God in his love and his mercy and compassion sent his son to die to redeem us, to reconcile us not only to himself, but to each other, church. And this work that started with God is God's work to finish. And he will finish it. It says, Paul says, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Church, that is a long time. I was talking to somebody this week and they asked me the question, why doesn't God just transform us like right away? 
Why can't God fix us? And the short answer to them was, I don't know. The long answer was, I really don't know. God desires to transform us, to change us from the inside out. But at the root of that, it's relationship. God, it's, it's not, okay, fix it, God, and then go on your way. It's God, I want to walk with you. And God desires to walk with us. God desires to be present with us in the ordinary, not just the big, but in the ordinary moments of life, church. And so our prayer as we walk through this life of David, that we would recognize God in the ordinary, in all the needs that go on around the house, in all the bills, in all the work, we'd recognize the opportunities that we have to identify and bear witness to what God is doing in us the transforming work that comes through relationship with him that we can only have because of his son. That's the gospel, church. Father, we thank you that you are at work, Lord. That you are faithful when we aren't and you see when we don't, Lord, and you never stop working. Father, even as we view the world around us and become discouraged by what sin has done to your good world, but we have participated in, Lord, in rejecting you. Father, we, we thank you that you love, that you forgive, that you redeem, that you desire, and you are pleased to call us your sons and daughters. Father, what? who are we, Lord? And we should be called children of God. And so, Father, I pray for those that are here in this room watching right now that don't know you. They don't know love. They don't know peace. Father, we pray right now that you would penetrate through all the defenses that they've put up. All the walls that we build to keep you out. We ask that right now by the power of your spirit you would speak. That you would speak life into death. Lord, that you would call people out of darkness into marvelous light not only to yourself, but to your people. <laughs> Lord, right now we ask that you would move, bringing revival to those who are dead. And Father, to us as your people, who are so prone to wander, who are so prone to forget you in all of the ordinariness of life, all the earthiness, Lord, we pray that you bring to mind that you are present, that you are active, and that you are working that we are not insignificant in your eyes. Lord, your, your sacrifice demonstrated how special we are to you, that you would go that far to redeem us. May we find our worth and our value in you, Lord. Father, help us to be mindful of you and to encourage each other that you are faithful to fulfill what you started. As we move into a time of worship, Father, we ask that you speak to our hearts, especially in the areas, the roles that you've called us to. May you minister something new about who you are, Lord. Meet with your people now, we ask. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.